Thank you, Jim, for inviting me and all of the co-hosts who are uh, of this presentation. I think this will take about 40 minutes. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about are the main reasons why I don't think there's a climate crisis. Uh, these, uh, my talk will be mostly scientific. I'll try to keep it fairly simple. Uh, but also, I'll, I'll dabble a little bit into uh, public policy, as you will see. So let's go ahead and get started. Just a short overview of what I'm going to be talking about. First of all, I do believe slow warming is occurring, uh, and, but not as fast as climate model forecasts say it should be. So I'll be reviewing that evidence. Now, the cause of warming, of course, that's a big deal. Is it entirely due to humans? Is it mostly due to nature? We really don't know, but I think the science is solid that some of it is due to CO2, but that is really nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, number three, obviously media reports and predictions are exaggerated or wrong. This is a problem that we have continuously, is that what the public understands is not really what's in, for instance, the United Nations IPCC reports. It's, it's greatly exaggerated, and a lot of it is just plain wrong. Fourth, there's no convincing evidence of more severe weather. Again, this is something that is greatly exaggerated. Uh, any of the well-balanced studies that have looked for actual meteorological evidence of increasing severe weather, there's almost you know, no evidence of it, keeping in mind that there can be multi-decadal changes in things like, say, global hurricane activity. Uh, number five, you know, this has to do with the policy, the economics. The cost of renewable energy, primarily solar and wind, remains high, and basic physics prevents a widespread displacement of fossil fuels with wind and solar simply because energy demand by the global population is just too high to meet it uh, with any substantial fraction of, of renewables until we have some sort of new renewable energy technology. And finally, something that's never talked about is that increasing CO2 does have certain benefits. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, primarily to agriculture through increased agricultural productivity. But the bottom line will be that is there is no climate crisis or emergency. <clears throat> so what am I fairly confident of? You know, if you talk to skeptics on this subject, and I'm considered a lukewarmer in that I believe there's been a certain amount of warming, uh, and that part of that warming is due to human CO2 emissions. Uh, so you'll get a different answer, from, you know, you different story from different skeptics, depending on who you talk to, you know, but we sort of agree on some basic points. Basically, we agree, number one, the climate system has warmed in recent decades. Uh, 2010 through 2019 was probably the warmest decade in the instrumental record. That is the last 150 years uh, for what it's worth. Number two, at least some of this warming is due to increasing CO2, as I've already mentioned. But you know, the direct warming effect of more CO2 isn't uh, isn't very alarming. Uh, and that's something I'm going to be talking about is, is why do the models produce so much warming, so much more warming than just the direct warming effect of, of, of CO2 increasing. And finally, I think warming should continue in the future. I'm not going to guarantee it. I would, if I was a betting man, I would bet better than a 50-50 chance that it's going to continue into the future. But none of this is necessarily cause for alarm because numbers matter. You know, not qualitative statements, but numbers matter. So what is uncertain about uh, climate change theory? Well, first of all, uh, for those of us that are old enough to remember that climate research back in the day, say 40 or 50 years ago, climate research was fairly boring. Not many people went into it because it wasn't terribly exciting. Uh, but the, th the things they studied was evidence for uh, the medieval warm period of a thousand years ago or the war Roman warm period of 2000 years ago uh, or the little ice age of several hundred years ago and trying to figure out, you know, basically just trying to document e evidence, document evidence that, that these things occurred. And some of the best evidence is the stuff you can see with your eyes. For instance, here I've got a picture of the retreating Mendehall Glacier. In, uh, in, in Alaska, it's been retreating through at least since 1900, before humans could be the cause, uh, which is significant in itself, but even more significant is as it retreats, it's revealing stumps of full-grown trees that have been carbon dated to about 1,000 to 1,500 years ago, which was the approximate time of the medieval warm period. Clearly, 
climate changes all by itself. We don't know why. Not, you know, I mean, there's theories out there, but we really don't know why. And what's annoying is that in the period of time that I've been working in this field, the, the, the professional field has transitioned from where it was just accepted that climate changed naturally to now, you know, lately people, scientists think, uh, well, all climate change must be human caused. And it, that conclusion is entirely arbitrary, unscientific, and yet it's what we see. And it's partly, you know, it's how people get money out of, out of the government to study these things. Uh, and something that I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, somewhat more is this, um, oh, let me go back, I'm trying to do something too fancy here. This idea that climate models are tuned to not produce cli natural climate change. And I'm going to be discussing that more in a minute. Let's see, what else is uncertain? Well, you know, I mentioned that the small direct warming from more CO2. It is, is very small, that direct warming from CO2. Uh, a direct warming from increasing CO2 if nothing else changed except temperatures. Doubling of CO2, let's say going from, going from 280 parts per million, which we think might have existed back in the mid 1800s, uh, projecting to get ahead to maybe 560 parts per million. So that's a doubling of CO2 by the end of the century. The direct warming effect, all of the, of the alarmists agree because it's sort of basic physics, would be about one degree C and if that was it, no one would care. The trouble is, is that other things in the climate system change. Those other changes are called feedbacks. So for instance, warming induced cloud changes or warming induced carbon dioxide changes and just about anything else you can think of uh, can change. And those things can either offset that one degree of warming or amplify it. Well, of course, the models, the climate models all tend to amplify the warming. And it's by a factor of three or four. The climate models take that one degree warming from a doubling of CO2 and, 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 and magnify it by a factor of three or four due to positive feedbacks in the climate system. I believe that these uh, positive feedbacks, you know, some of them I think do exist, but they are pretty small. And we all know from an engineering standpoint, the net effect, the net feedback effect in the climate system is negative. This is something I'm often asked about engineers. You know, why do they say there's you know, positive feedbacks in the climate system? Well, it's because the biggest feedback, which is called the Planck effect, which is the fact that the earth emits more infrared radiation to outer space as it warms up, okay? Nobody, including all the climate models, can get past the fact that that is the stabilizing influence on the climate system. In other words, there's no such thing as net positive feedback in the climate system. Otherwise, adding CO2 to the global atmosphere would cause the earth to burn up and eventually consume the whole universe. <laughs> you know, it's just not possible. So uh, my view, uh, this, this bottom uh, bullet here, based on the research we've done on feedbacks, I, I, I have a weak opinion. It's not a strong opinion. I have a weak opinion that a doubling of CO2 would cause about one and a half to two degrees C of warming, but I can't prove it. It's just sort of, you know, my best educated guess. Um, now here's something I'm gonna address briefly because even with some technical people, a lot of people don't understand this. Any temperature change in anything you can think of is caused by energy imbalance. An imbalance between energy gained by the system, whether it's your house, a car engine, uh, the climate system, uh, a pot of water on the stove, all of these things, the temperature change is due to an energy imbalance, imbalance between energy gain and energy loss. And uh, Will Happer once told me that uh, one of the greatest uh, illustrations of this is the interior of the sun. Uh, most of you probably are not aware that the interior of the sun where energy is generated, that the rate of energy generation per kilogram of sun mass in the core of the sun is actually less than what the human body produces through metabolism. Yet the core of the sun is 27 million degrees and we're, you know, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, supposedly. Huge difference, right? What's the difference? Well, the difference obviously isn't the rate of energy generation. It's how fast energy can then be shed. You know, the human body can shed 
its energy to its cooler surroundings readily. The interior of the sun is greatly protected and it takes thousands of years for that energy to filter out through the sun, out to the sun's surface, where it can escape to outer space. So in the case of the sun, the super high temperatures are due to an inability, an inefficiency you know, of energy loss to outer space. So again, bottom line is temperature is not determined by the rate of energy gain alone. For, ex ex for example, the rate of absorbed sunlight by the earth. It's due to an imbalance between that energy gain and all the mechanisms of energy loss, which in a global sense is the emission of infrared radiation to outer space, because that's the only way the earth has to cool ultimately in the whole. Okay. Um, how big is this energy imbalance? We've seen that the oceans, and I'm talking about the deep oceans, you know, the volume of the oceans have, has, has warmed uh, by several hundredths of a degree in recent, uh, recent decades. Uh, in fact, uh, down to about 2,000 meters depth, globally averaged, the rate of warming is about, I'm looking at this graph that you're looking at on slide six, uh, 100 to uh, 300 degrees per decade, it looks like. Uh, it's a very slow rate of warming. You can even question whether we can measure that. This is basically from the couple of thousand of Argo floats, uh, buoy floats that are going around the ocean all the time, being carried by the ocean currents, going down to 2,000 meters depth, coming up to the surface, transmitting their data, and then diving down again. Uh, taking, so we've got these random measurements all over the global oceans, and this is the final result of their analysis of how fast the oceans are warming. That is looked at you know, by everyone, alarmists and skeptics alike, uh, as a measure of the rate at which the Earth is absorbing excess energy. In other words, the global energy imbalance. That energy imbalance is less than one watt per square meter. That's compared to the average flows in and out of the climate system of something like 240 watts per square meter, okay? So that's about one part in 300. Now the point I wanna make in this slide is that the energy imbalance that is causing the oceans to warm, the climate system to warm, is only one part in 300. We do not know any of the natural energy influence, uh, any energy flows in the climate system to anywhere near that level of precision. Why is that significant? Because it could be warming, could be mostly natural, and we would never know it. Because we don't know any of the natural energy flows to that level of precision. I hope that makes sense to you, and it's an important point. It's one of the most important points I try to get across to people. That means even though it's entirely possible all of the warming could be due to humans, that statement is largely a matter of scientific faith. It cannot be proved. We don't have good evidence to support it. All we can do is make assumptions. And the assumption that is usually made is that the climate system is naturally in a state of energy balance until humans come along and cause an imbalance. Okay? Important point. Uh, our best satellites cannot measure to 0.8 watts per square meter, the energy flows in the climate system. The accuracy of our best uh, Earth radiation budget, budget instruments, the series instruments flying on several satellites uh, is about five to 10 watts per square meter, not 0.8 watts per square meter. And by the way, this big antenna instrument thing on the front of this satellite that carries a series instruments. This is the AMSER instrument that uh, Jim O'Brien in his introduction mentioned, which I'm the principal investigator on. Okay. Climate models that supposedly prove humans are responsible for global warming use circular reasoning. The reason is, is because when they build a climate model, which is you know, just a computer program where they put in all of the physics they understand, uh, to their best abil of their ability, along with a lot of things that aren't very well understood, including how clouds form and dissipate and precipitate and all of that. When they build these models, they, they are not in energy balance. And this has always been a problem. 
they put the best physics they know of into these, into these uh, climate models and then run the models forward in time. And after 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years, the model will either warm or cool. And it's because they don't have the physics right. So what they have to do is they have to adjust the physics in, or the parameterizations of clouds. Or they have all kinds of tuning, ways of tuning these models to where the model does not produce any warming. So they get the energy balance to where, by definition, in their assumption, energy gain equals energy loss, okay? And so the climate model doesn't change in its temperature. Then they add CO2 and, oh, look, the climate system warms in the model. Well, of course, that's what you assumed from the outset, that there's no natural causes of climate change. And so the only thing that can change the climate in the climate model is, is when they make a change to it, which is adding CO2. And they, I mean, it's okay. It just is they misrepresent these results. They say that the basic physics shows it's got to be due to CO2. No, the basic physics don't show it. You assumed it at the outset. It's circular reasoning. Then they might say, well, but there are these fingerprints of warming, that, that, that human warming looks different than other kinds of warming, except that's not true. I mean, there are fingerprints of warming. We do have fingerprints that it is warm, uh, but not the causation of warming. Any source of warming will look about the same. Land will warm faster than the oceans. Warming will be largest at northern latitudes and least at southern latitudes due to the land-ocean distribution, because land heats up a lot faster than the ocean, the ocean can quickly mix the extra heat downward and keep the surface cooler. And then they'll point out, but what about this uh, stratospheric cooling going on at the same time? Well, that might be an, uh, actually a fingerprint of increasing CO2. Things are much simpler physics-wise in the stratosphere. But stratospheric cooling is not warming down here in the troposphere and at the surface of the Earth, okay? Um, but let's assume all the warming has been due to humans, okay? Well, we've been working with Department of Energy funding. We've been working on a, a simple 1D time-dependent energy balance model where we try to match the model to what the best observations are. And the main observations are the global average surface temperature, how fast the oceans have been absorbing some of that heat. Those are the two main things, okay? And we've also thrown in the observed record of El Nino and La Nina activity, which we found and published, actually changes the energy budget somewhat. Um, and so we've, we've run simulations with a simple 1D model. And what I'm showing here, the purple squiggly line is just one of the global uh, sea surface temperature data sets. The blue lines are our 1D model. So you see our 1D model going off with that solid blue line. That's our best fit to what's going on. Uh, the dashed blue line is what the model produces for deep ocean warming. That basically, that matches what has been observed from one of the ocean, deep ocean data sets. But look at the climate models, the, the latest CMIP-6 climate models. Now look, at a first glance, they look like they are pretty well matching the observations. And that's what the climate modelers say is that the the observed warming trends match the observations. But if you look into the details, there has been a divergence since about the year 2000, and it's, it's significant. And the best fit to the observations with a simple model gives a, uh, a climate sensitivity only 1.9 degrees. That's half of what the average CMIP-6 climate model produces. Okay, that's, that's pretty significant. And if you've heard John Christie on this before, he's shown you other evidence to back this up. Now, there's other published studies. We're not the only ones, you know, that are skeptics that are publishing stuff like this. It goes, I'm, this is just some selected examples of papers that have gone into either the observational evidence or the theoretical evidence that climate sensitivity is probably quite a bit lower than what the climate models assume, Okay. Uh, a lot of this started back in 2001 with Dick Lindzen's iris theory that as the climate system warms up, high altitude clouds that uh, detrain from convective systems, especially in the tropics, dissipate in such a way to let more infrared radiation out to space. Um, so that's what, uh, 
that, that was his, and I, I think that actually occurs. We're, we're doing uh, comparisons between observations, and I'm talking about series, the, the energy budget models, or I mean, I'm sorry, the energy budget instruments that are on satellites. We're, we're comparing those to climate models and basically finding that, that I think Dick is right, uh, maybe not as right as, as he originally claimed in, in terms of how big the effect is, but it does look like there's an iris effect. And then there's been a series of papers involving either myself or Dick Lindzen or, or um, J. Ray Bates, who's, who's one of the co-sponsors uh, of, of my talk here. Um, and then most recently, Nick Lewis and Judith Curry, who did something similar to what I'm doing with energy budgets and saying, hey, look, you know, we assume the same forcing as everybody else, the same <coughs> ocean temperature data sets the same surface temperature data sets, and we only get one and a half to 1.7 degrees C climate sensitivity, much less than the climate models. So there's just a lot of lines of evidence here that have been published to suggest climate sensitivity is not as large as what we are being told, and therefore the global warming problem isn't as bad as what we are being told. This is our most recent satellite temperature update. Uh, this is something that John Christie talks a lot about. He, we've been We've been doing this for over 30 years now, uh, monthly updates to global satellite temperatures. Uh, yes, there's a warming trend since 1979, uh, but it's only about 50% of what the CMIP-6 climate models produce when you do an apples to apples comparison. We're not monitoring surface temperatures here, we're monitoring the deep troposphere, okay? And some people will say, well, people don't live up high in the atmosphere. Well, they don't live deep in the ocean, do they? And yet the alarmists use the deep ocean warming. Now, this is something where there's a lot of hypocrisy going around among scientists when they try to argue against what we do. Uh, you know, they point to the deep ocean warming of hundreds of a degree as being so significant, even though nobody lives there. But then they want to discount the lack of as much warming in the, in the atmosphere as the models produce as, oh, well, you know, humans don't live up high in the atmosphere. Well, the satellite advantages are not just global coverage, which thermometers don't produce, okay? We do have global coverage except for a couple of small patches right around the North Pole and South Pole. But also, number two, the troposphere is where most feedbacks occur. The troposphere can be thought of as sort of a, a layer of the atmosphere that largely determines how much the surface of the earth is going to warm. For instance, clouds. Clouds are the main sunshade of the earth. Sunshade of the earth. You know, they reflect about 30% of the sun's energy back to outer space, keeping the earth from getting warmer still, okay? So, but, and where are those clouds? They're in the troposphere. What happens in the troposphere is extremely important to climate sensitivity and what's happening in the climate system. And, and what we're finding from the satellite data is the troposphere is only warming about as, half as fast as what the climate models, the latest climate models predict. So once again, this factor of two is just hanging in there. A lot of lines of evidence that the models are at least uh, a factor of two, too great in their, in their estimated warming. Little more from here, from our uh, 1D model, the top plot zooms in on the period just up to 2020, and it shows the blue line, uh, how closely we match the observed temperatures. And this isn't just a statistical fit. This is based on physics we've observed from space, that when there's an El Nino and La Nina, we see changes in the series radiative budget, and we adjust parameters in the model so that it matches what the series rated budget measurements say is, is, is happening with El Nino and La Nina. And so you see the model in blue uh, represents our best estimate of what's happened in global average sea surface temperatures since 1880 up to 2020. And green are the observations from ERSST version five. I've, I've done these comparisons with other sea surface temperature data sets and they give somewhat different results. This is just one of the data sets. As I mentioned, the model when it's run to match both the surface and this plot below, which is the deep ocean since 1940, the warming trend, the blue is the, is, is, is the model, the green is the observations, their best estimates. Uh, 
estimates are pretty bad before about 2000 in the deep ocean. Uh, we get about 1.9 degree uh, Celsius for, for, uh, for our climate sensitivity. Now that assumes that all of the forcing that's causing the warming is due to humans. It could be there's a natural source of, of warming that is occurring and we don't even know what it is. That would reduce climate sensitivity even below 1.9 degrees. So, you know, it could be closer to one degree. Who knows? Huge amount of, uh, of uncertainty. I mentioned that even though the climate modelers claim that their models agree with the surface observations uh, pretty closely, they usually show a plot like since 1900 or 1880. Uh, but really, most of the warming has only been since about, let's say, 1960, because there really hadn't been much in the way of CO2 emissions until then. And in fact, even then, there was really strong, supposedly really strong aerosol cooling from sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere that didn't go away until the 1970s. So really, our best, most robust estimate of how much it's warming should be about since the 1970s when these aerosol effects, cooling aerosol effects went away, CO2 keeps getting pumped into the atmosphere. So really since the 1970s is what we should be looking at. And so this plot shows from one, from Hadcrut 4, so this is the UK's uh, you know, best estimate of, of warming trends from land and ocean. Uh, Hadley and uh, Climate Research Unit, you know, one does one does land and one does ocean and they combine them together and, and they get this global average warming trend. And then you see these other curves, which is an average of CMIP5 models and then the CMIP6 models. I mean, it, it looked like they were agreeing, but about since about 2000, there's been a divergence between the two. Will that continue? I don't know. I, I'm not, I can't predict the future, at least not with great confidence. But this is just one more piece of evidence of what I'm talking about, that it seems like global temperatures, when you look at the details, are diverging from uh, the models. Now, how good are these temperatures, all right? I mean, there's a lot of controversy about this blue line. How good are these temperatures? Um, some of us are skeptical about the, all of the adjustments that have been made to them. It seems like every time they make a new version of the surface temperature data sets, there's more and more warming that appears in them, which seems statistically unlikely, <laughs> let's say. Um, so re about eight years ago, I started looking at least U.S. Well, I looked at global temperature, surface temperature data, land surface temperature data. Uh, and then I revisited this uh, in the last several weeks, looking at U.S. temperatures, since we have a lot of data. It doesn't extend back very far. But first of all, what I looked at was, this is the official USHCN data set for the United States. And I looked at, for each station, okay, this graph uh, on, this, on this page shows each, each dot on this graph is a station, a different weather station. Uh, and this takes all of the USHCN stations that are used for monitoring warming uh, trends in the United States. And what I've got here is a plot of, on the vertical axis, the temperature trends, the linear temperature trends for the periods 73, 1973 up through 2020 versus population density. And you have to do this sort of on a nonlinear scale. Uh, a power relationship is better than logarithmic. And uh, it's been found many years ago, 50 years ago, that um, a, fourth, a fourth root of the population density or of the population is, is, is a pretty good linearization of the data. Uh, so this is temperature trend versus population density at all of these different stations in the USHCN data set. And you see that on average, even though there's a lot of scatter, the warming trends at stations in the US goes up with population density. And that's true in the raw data because NOAA provides the raw unadjusted data. That's the black dots. The red dots are their adjustments with all of their homogenization procedures and comparing neighboring stations and I guess looking for breakpoints and doing all of these adjustments, all right? There's still 
a dependence of the warming trends, even in their adjusted data, on the population density. All right, this shouldn't be there. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem because I'm not showing where these stations are. For instance, it could be that in this close to 50 year period, 1973 to 2020, it could be that the least warming occurred where there was the lowest population densities, uh, say in the Northern Plains, okay? Uh, and it could be that most of the warming has just naturally occurred where there are more cities. That's possible. You know, some regional changes, regional uh, variations in, in actual climate trends. So the next thing we can do is here, I've only dealt with differences, differences in trends and differences in population for closely spaced stations. The period is the same, 1973 to 2020. I've used a data set, which is not USHCN. USHCN is mostly cooperative stations where people have volunteered to take maximum and minimum temperature measurements, uh, you know, continuously. Uh, there's problems because the, data, the, the, the instruments aren't very well maintained. What I did was I decided to look at the data, which is mostly not included in USHCN, which is airports. I mean, at least in the United States, most of our weather data that extends back many decades is taken at airports. Usually, well, now on an hourly basis, uh, it used to be more on a three hourly basis. A lot of it had to be recorded manually before the internet. I'm getting, a, I'm getting a notice that my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully this will continue and not break up. Okay, uh, so I've used these airport stations to see whether this relationship exists, and it does. I mean, it shows up differently when you've got a plot. This graph here is, is of differences, okay? But that line, that regression line through there, okay, when you take what that says and adjust for what that says, how warming increases with more population density, it reduces the full station average warming trend in the United States from plus 0.27 degrees per decade to plus 0.17 degrees per decade. And this coefficient I'm getting, I won't go into it, between uh, temperature trend and population uh, density is very close to what I got from the USHCN. So both data sets, both the USHCN and an almost totally independent temperature data set from these airport thermometers are showing the same thing. For some reason, urban areas are warming more than your rural areas. Now, that's different from saying urban areas are warmer than rural areas, okay? It's obvious that urban areas are warmer. I mean, I see it every day on my car thermometer, right? Going to and from work. Everybody experiences this, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's that the warming trend over time in the urban areas is warming even faster than in the rural areas. It's not obvious why that would be, unless it has something to do with economic activity. Um, you know, that even in the highly populated areas, we keep building more buildings, more parking lots. I mean, people aren't just making their coffee at home now, right? They want a $7 cup of Starbucks coffee every morning, which means you've got thousands of Starbucks stores that have gone up, some of which have new parking lots that didn't previously exist. This is just one example, you know, where there is prosperity, uh, you know, and, and disposable income, there are more stores, more parking lots to service all of that economic activity. And that's all I can think of is what's going on there. So conclusions from this preliminary surface temperature data analysis that we're playing with. Number one, I think the official estimates of land surface warming appear to be biased too high, probably due to increasing urban heat island effects. But this may only be in prosperous areas. I mean, maybe this is maybe the biggest effect that we're seeing is just here in the United States. It could be that it doesn't exist in, in the UK, that it doesn't exist in Ireland, that it doesn't exist in Europe. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and remember, this is important because to the extent that global warming observations, the temperature trends diagnosed from surface thermometers around the world, to the extent those have exaggerated the real warming trend, 
of the globe, it reduces climate sensitivity, okay? It directly goes in to how sensitive the climate system is. In other words, you know, if there had been no warming in the last hundred years, then obviously climate sensitivity is zero. The earth doesn't care. The climate system doesn't care how much CO2 you add, okay? All right, uh, I got asked to just add one slide on sea level rise. As most of you already know, sea level was rising since the mid 1800s. Uh, you know, back then it was just uh, tide gauges scattered around the world. And I start this plot in 1880 uh, because I've, I've read the opinion that that's probably about the earliest date that you could talk about a global average of sea level from uh, tide gauges, coastal tide gauges. Uh, and so I just, you know, I took this record from Church and White, I think is out of Australia, you know, one of the main combination, you know, tide gauge and satellite records, I think, of, 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 of how sea level has risen. And if we just kind of eyeball or look at what the, um, what the sea level rise rate was before CO2 could have caused it, let's say before 1940, and then look at it more recently, that purple line, okay? That purple line. And just think that, okay, well, maybe this is the natural sea level rise from coming out of the little ice age. And then maybe this acceleration in it, uh, the purple line represents the human influence. Let's just, you know, playing what if games here. You're talking about a very small human influence. Uh, what do I get? I, a 0.3 inches. The total, you know, natural plus anthropogenic rise is 0.8. The natural was 0.5. That means humans are responsible for 0.3 inches per decade, which is about eight millimeters per decade. I mean, it's not totally insignificant if you're building infrastructure on a low-lying coastal area that you want to last for 50 years. You know, you might want to worry about it. I don't know, but it's mostly natural. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this stuff, but it just seems um, kind of a no-brainer to me that, that this is not the problem that they're claiming it is. Now, of course, the public is increasingly alarmed, right? I mean, this is partly to get uh, clicks on the internet so that the news outlets can make their ad revenue. But for instance, here's a news article from, uh, from the Graniad, I'm sorry, is it Graniad or Guardian? <laughs> That's an inside joke I hear. Okay, so the, the global warming of the oceans is equivalent to an atomic bomb per second, all right, of energy release. Well, that sounds dramatic, right? But I've already showed you that the anthropogenic part of warming is only one part in 300 of the natural energy flows. In other words, Okay, if humans are putting in one atomic bomb per second of energy into the ocean, the sun is putting 300 atomic bombs of energy into the ocean every second. You know, it's, it's just a way that the media has of exaggerating something which is actually pretty small compared to what nature does naturally. Okay, so exaggerations. We've got this, I've got this list of popular claims. You know, we keep hearing the hottest year ever. Well, who cares? If, if, the hot, if each year is hotter than the, the, the previous year by a hundredth of a degree, who's going to care? Sure, it's a record warm, but by how much? Numbers matter. Number two, wildfires are increasing. You know, we have a lot of wildfire issues out in the West. Our most recent, uh, well, well, in the Western U.S., wintertime is wildfire season. It you know, has a strong seasonal cycle in, I'm sorry, summertime is, is, is wildfire season. There's a strong seasonal cycle in, in precipitation. So during the winter, they get the precipitation out there, which causes all the vegetation to grow. And then in the summer, it all dries out and becomes fuel for fires. So there's always been wildfire problems out there. And uh, it got really bad this last year when we had an unusually, a very unusual weather event. Uh, and what that weather event was, an unusually cold high pressure area uh, came down out of Canada, okay, and produced strong, dry, easterly downslope winds to the west of the Sierra Mountains, uh, causing huge fire danger. But the ultimate cause was an unusually cold, high-pressure area. And yet we're supposed to believe this is due to global warming, right? Because global warming can cause uh, 
temperatures that are too high and temperatures that are too low, apparently. Uh, storms are worsening. No, it's not true. There's no good evidence that any storm intensity has, has increased. Hurricanes have large uh, variability. Uh, there's some recent evidence that there might be some increase, but the variability from one decade to the next is so, so great that it could be in the next 10 years, we'll see it go the other direction. Hard to say. Very tenuous kind of claim. Crops are failing. This is something that is just pure BS. It's not happening. I've consulted with grain growing interests for the last 10 years here in the United States, uh, giving them long range forecasts of, of, of what uh, growing weather will be during June, July, and August in the corn belt of the United States. And basically uh, grain yields, not just in the US, but around the world increase, not every year, but the long-term trend is upward. And this is something that Al Gore in his most recent uh, movie just blatantly lied about. I have no idea where he got his misinformation from, but it was untrue. Uh, you know, humans are suffering, right? Climate-related deaths, climate refugees. It, it, it makes no sense. Uh, we, we've known for a long time that cold kills about 10 times as many people as, as excessive heat. There aren't, as far as I'm concerned, there are no climate deaths. And uh, poverty, not weather, is the greatest threat to human flourishing. And, uh, and then, of course, there's always this claim from Greta Thunberg or Al Gore or John Kerry or whoever, we only have a certain number of years left to fix the problem, right? Five years left, 10 years left. Well, you know, I've been working in this area for, what, over 40 years. And for as long as I can remember, we've always had only 10 years left. Here's the global uh, crop productivity. Crop yields continue to break records, growing uh, both both total production and cereal yields on a global basis have increased faster than the population growth. Uh, this is totally opposite of what Paul Ehrlich predicted was going to happen in his 1968 book, uh, po The Population Bomb. Uh, the truth is that weather-related mortality is down in the last century. And that's primarily because through the prosperity that is brought about due to access to abundant and affordable energy, we build infrastructure to protect ourselves from severe weather events. So while damage might increase over time because infrastructure increases over time, it's not because the weather's gotten worse. Uh, that's the point of this plot, which I think is from Roger Pilkey Jr showing global weather losses as a percent of global GDP have, if anything, gone down since 1990. This is from Munich Re data. Uh, and Roger Pilkey Jr. considers himself an environmentalist, but he doesn't like environmentalists or the Greens lying about statistics. So he, this is what he shows. Uh, electricity costs across uh, Europe uh, have a pretty good, um, are pretty directly related to the fraction of electrical generation that it comes from wind and solar. Uh, Germany has basically doubled its cost of electricity just through getting 20% of its, of its electricity from uh, renewables. It's, it's expensive energy and money spent on, uh, extra money spent on energy means less money that can go into things that are more important, like say healthcare or caring for the poor. Uh, so, you know, choice, good choices have to be made about where we spend our money. Uh, I'm almost done here. Uh, I, I don't have high hopes about whether the situation is gonna change in terms of energy policy. Uh, this is something that I've talked to Rush Limbaugh in the past. Uh, he's, he's told me the same thing that he doesn't think it's gonna change. Um, things will probably get worse before they get better. Things won't turn around until the public finally realizes that their standard of living is being reduced by an unrealistic, unphysical reliance on expensive and intermittent renewable energy. So, you know, the people will continue to be fooled. Uh, you know, the climate modelers, let's go down this list. The climate modelers will continue uh, to, to claim that we're gonna have a lot of warming in the future, and why shouldn't they? That's their career now. If, if, if the global warming problem goes away, 
climate modelers lose their funding and they no longer have that field to work in. Education system, I mean, teachers uh, seem to want to indoctrinate our children that, that the earth is being destroyed. The news media, of course, uh, you know, there's this uh, saying, if it bleeds, it leads. So if uh, they will uh, talk to, they will, you know, they will interview, put on the TV, uh, whoever, whatever scientist comes along and gives some outrageous claim about how bad global warming is going to be. Entertainment industry, you know, disasters make good movies, right? Number five, political leaders and government agencies, they're all, you know, can't let a, a crisis go to waste, or at least even if it's just a perceived crisis. Uh, government grants, programs, and mandates. This is something that the U.S. President uh, Eisenhower had warned against, that because he, he, he left when he was leaving office, there was a huge push to get the scientists uh, funded by the government, and he claimed that that meant that politicians would basically then control the direction of science and that it would go in the direction of whatever policy changes the politicians wanted, and that's what we've seen. Uh, number seven, of course, there's all kinds of rent, rent seekers. You can, you know, people can, uh, can advocate uh, renewable energy, especially if they stand to make a lot of money, if, if uh, more solar panels and more wind turbines get installed, right? Uh, of course, there's a lot of increase, there's an increasing number of activists, uh, even uh, co in corporations, uh, I've always said, you know, at some point, the CEOs of, of, of oil companies, Exxon Mobil, doesn't matter what oil company you talk about, are eventually going to say, you know, why should I try to fight this? I'll just say, yeah, it's global warming's a problem, but the public's still going to need petroleum. And if there's an increase in tax, uh, carbon tax, let's say, for consuming petroleum, you know, oil industry doesn't pay for it, the consumers do. So, why should, uh, why, should, why should oil companies take the PR hit from you know, being climate deniers? They'll just join the green wagon. Uh, they'll, they'll make money anyway. Uh, so, and we have an increasingly frightened and guilt-ridden public. So everything's working against anything changing in this field anytime soon. So, um, so for a climate emergency to exist and require a change in energy policy, first of all, climate change and warming must be beyond what humanity is already used to. Well, we're not there yet, I don't think. The cause must be greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's not clear to me. I personally believe at least half of the warming uh, is probably due to increasing CO2, but that means we really don't have a problem. Uh, the cure, Solar and wind energy cannot cause more harm than simple adaptation. This is something that Bjorn Lomborg has campaigned about for decades. Uh, and the benefits of positive externalities of extra CO2 must also be taken account, into account, which they never are. Um, Craig Idso has calculated based on published data that there's probably been a $4 trillion increase in global agricultural productivity since 1960 just because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. So my conclusion is there's no climate crisis, but there will be a humanitarian crisis if we allow what I call the warmongers to get their way. <laughs>